Good evening. Welcome everybody to the next in the series of the BOFAS Lectures of Distinction. Um, my name is Robert Clayton. I'm a Media and Communications Director for BOFAS and I'm usually behind the scenes at these. I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker this week, who is my co friend and colleague James Ritchie, who is based in the southeast of England in Kent and Sussex, primarily in Tunbridge Wells. Um, he has been a highly specialised foot and ankle surgeon for at least 15 years. He used to serve as webmaster and on the scientific committee of the British Orthopaedic Foot and Ankle Society, and he was recently elected as a council member of the European Foot and Ankle Society. And he has a fount of knowledge on all things, and he will give you what I guarantee will be a well-informed, well-researched and highly entertaining talk. James, thank you very much and over to you. Okay, so I hope uh, you can all see this now. Um, Robert, uh, thank you very much for a very generous introduction and all I can say is, well, no pressure then, eh? Um, so, um, as advertised, um, here we go, uh, Hallux valgus uh, or bunions, everything you always wanted to know but were too afraid to ask. So, um, what I'm going to try and cover today uh, oh, hang on, except for that my PowerPoint isn't, oh, here we go. Firstly, in conventional, modern convention, I have to say that um, I have nothing to declare but my genius and more to the point, I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to declare on this topic. What I'm hoping to cover tonight then is an overview of Halex Valgus, certainly how to approach things in clinic and I hope what you need to know to get you through the FRCS or exam. Specifically, what is it? Why does it occur? What problems does it cause? What can be done about it? And how well do those kind of things work? So firstly, what's in a name as Shakespeare wrote? Bunyan, what does it mean? Well, it means a, a swelling at the base of the um, foot great toe around the first MTP joint. But where the name comes from is not clear. It may be 16th century East Anglian dialect, bunny meaning a swelling, or archaic French buigne, um, also a swelling, or the one may have led to the other. Either way, it only enters the medical or paramedical literature in 1845 when Louis, Louis Derlacher, who was the chiropodist who became surgeon chiropodist to Queen Victoria, published his work Corns and Bunions. And the medical term hallux valgus or hallux abducto valgus was first coined by Karl Hüter, who was a German surgeon in 1871. So what is it then? Well, how does, how does this arise? Well, in essence, as you see from these two slides, to move from the normal first ray alignment to the hallux valgus deformity on the right, there has to be some failure or disruption of the first MTP joint and specifically the MCL sesamoid complex, which should be stabilizing that. The first metatarsal head moves off the sesamoids. Whether that's the primary event or whether in fact the primary failure is more proximally at the first TMT joint here is not clear. And that's a subject of controversy, which I'll come back to a little bit later, but either way, clearly the first MTP joint has to fail. And specifically what happens at that level we see here. So in the normal uh, position, we have the metatarsal with its crista positioned evenly over the two sesamoids with the tendons either side. When we move to hallux valgus, the metatarsal has started to sublux off the sesamoids and also started to rotate. It usually has a degree of pronation going on there. But why does that occur? Well, the short answer actually is nobody really knows. Um, it's probably complex and multifactorial and it may be different um, across different patients. And it's really when a set of random factors come together that we end up with this end stage deformity. We do know some things about it. It is four times more common in women than in men. And often there is a positive family history. 80% uh, of people with this condition have a positive uh, maternal family history but so far no gene defect has been identified. What about bad shoes? Are these kind of things here the actual cause of the problem? Well, that's controversial. It stands to reason that to some extent they may be. However, Halix valgus can occur in unshod populations as well. So I think one would have to say the jury's a little bit out on that. 
There are certain other forms of pathology which are associated with hallux valgus, specifically ligamentous laxity, if leading to a hypermobile first ray and potential instability there, hence a bite and score of more than five out of nine. Other foot deformities, flat foot deformities and pes planus, but also neurological disorders leading to pes cavus. Inflammatory disorders like rheumatoid disease causing failure of, and destruction of the joint itself can cause it. And there's also an association with tight uh, Achilles tendons or gastrocnemius tightness, hence a sulfur skill test is part of the examination for this condition. So what actual problems does this cause? Well, when you're taking history, it's very important to try and tease this out from patients because it can present in a, in a very diverse number of ways. Um, one of the first and obvious is that because of the widening of the forefoot, the patient is unable to wear enclosed shoes. And that's something that one sees a lot of at this time of year where um, a lot of women will manage through the summer wearing sandals and then come autumn, they have to start wearing boots or enclosed shoes or uh, in Tunbridge Wells riding boots. And therefore they start to get pressure on the bunny and it becomes painful. So they decide to seek help. And that's a simple mechanical issue. The footwear is pressing on the displaced medial eminence and potentially on the dorsomedial branch of the digital nerve, and that causes pain. And this is something which can be improved significantly with surgeries, a problem we can solve. But what if the pain is not so much pressure on the medial eminence, but what if it's actually joint pain? And, and the warning sign there is if the pain is not so much with shoes, but with pain walking in bare feet. And at that point in the history, you need to start thinking, well, could this be arthritis of the first MTP joint? Is it actually more of a hallux rigidus than a hallux valgus problem? In which case, doing joint preserving surgery to correct the hallux valgus is, is less likely to be successful, and you need to proceed with caution there or think about uh, an entirely different set of surgical procedures. What about transfer metatarsalgia? So the first ray is defunctioned and, and pain is felt across the lesser MTP joints. Often patients will describe a stone or a pebble in their shoe, or as one a very nice French lady said when I asked if that was that was the case, she said, uh, uh, no, it's not a stone. It's like the stone of an olive in my shoe. And uh, there you go, French people have olive stones, English people have pebbles. Anyway, it's that kind of feeling, and that is, again, something that we can help surgically. If the first ray is corrected and refunctioned, you can actually alleviate the pain across the lesser rays, even though when you say to your patient, ah, I will cure your second and third MTP joint pain by correcting your bunion, they may look at you as if you're completely mad. But if you explain the mechanics, it makes sense. What about cosmesis? I hate my feet, they are ugly. Or as again, I've heard in clinic, if only I had beautiful feet, my husband would love me again, which is rather tragic, really. Um, this is alarm bells time. Uh, if these are unrealistic expectations, well, unless he's got a real foot fetish, I suppose. And to be honest, it, cosmetic as a basis for foot, for foot surgery is fraught with difficulty. You may take a shoe, a foot that is ugly, but pain-free and turn it into a foot that is beautiful, but painful, uh, which is obviously a bad thing. So shy away from cosmetic foot surgery would be my suggestion. What about concern over progression? You, know, My bunions aren't too bad, but I'm really worried because my mum or dad has terrible bunions and I don't want to end up with feet like that. Well, I, again, I would suggest that prophylaxis is a poor basis for surgical reconstruction in the foot. If the patient is simply worried about progression but has few problems at the moment, I would suggest you reassure them and leave them alone. They can always come back when it deteriorates and becomes symptomatic and be dealt with at that time. So transfer mesotarsalgia, just a little word about that further, because again, it's a concept with which um, patients sometimes struggle. Here we see a Peter Barograph uh, of the foot. You don't need to have a Peter Barograph in clinic. In most cases, you can simply look at the foot and examine where the callosities are. So here we see nice callosity under the second and fifth metatarsal heads, but nothing under the first. And that's because this patient isn't loading the first ray. She's loading the second and the fifth. And the key thing here is that with time, you can get a synovitis in the MTP joints, 
which ultimately lead to stretching or rupture of the ligaments, particularly the plantar plate, and therefore evolving deformity of the lesser toes, um, which if you're going to do surgery to create hallux valgus, you may also need to consider surgery to the lesser rays and in particular repair of the plantar plate. So hallux valgus is easy to diagnose. A patient takes their shoes off and it's blindingly obvious there's a bunion. But just to summarize, I think you need to listen very carefully to what actually is the problem the patient is experiencing. And also to consider the whole foot, not just the forefoot and the first ray, but also the lesser rays and the person who's attached to it. Um, for best results, it's not really about doing super clever, clever surgery. It's actually selecting the treatment most likely to deal with the patient's problem. And as I reiterate, I would just say no to cosmetic foot surgery. So examination. Well, the diagnosis here is obvious, a hallux valgus, some inflammation on the medial eminence, a hammering second toe with a dorsal callosity and pronation of the great toe, as well as some early clawing of the lesser rays. So how do you assess it clinically? Well, you need to observe the patient standing and walking and look not just at the forefoot, but actually at the alignment of the limb as a whole. What's the knee doing? What's the ankle doing? Are they in cavus? Are they in planus, et cetera? You need to consider pronation of the great toe. Where are the callosities? Where are the pressure areas? Where, how are the mechanics of this foot working? So look at the sole because that's where the callosities are likely to be. Is the deformity correctable? Can you straighten out the hallux? And is it painful when you do so? You need to consider first NTP arthritis. Is the joint tender? Do a grind test. Is there pain on the range of motion? And also is the first ray hypermobile? And finally, consider is there tightness in the calf or gastrocnemius? Do a sulfur skill test. It really takes very little time at all. The grind test is performed like this. There's axial load performed on the first MTP joint and, and the joint is then manipulated to see if it's painful. And if there is osteoarthritis, this does obviously potentially change your surgical algorithm. What about first ray hypermobility? Well, again, this is a clinical diagnosis really. There is actually a jig for testing it, but it's a, it's a research tool more than anything else. And effectively, this is like a Lackman test, but of the first uh, TMT joint. So with one hand, as shown here, you hold the first ray, with the other, you hold the lesser rays and you want to blot them against one another. And it's said that more than nine millimeters dorsal plantar translation indicates instability. You can also look at it on a lateral standing x-ray where the first TMT joint may well gap um, when weight bearing. And if you do think you have instability here, you need to do a, look, a bite and score on the rest of the patient and consider their overall hypermobility status. However, as I said before, the role of first ray hypermobility in hallux valgus is controversial. It's a question of chicken and egg potentially. It may be in some cases that the ray is hypermobile and that is the cause of the hallux valgus. It may be in some cases that actually the hallux valgus develops because of MTP joint problems and the hypermobility of the ray is only secondary to that, in which case you can, of course, correct it, the deformity, and expect the ray to become stable. And there have been some studies, particularly Michael Cochran's work, actually suggesting that could be the case. So clinical assessment is important. It's important to pick up any other pathology that may be going on. And it's always worth thinking about the vascular and neurological status as seen here on the right. Also to assess the suitability of the patient and their deformity for surgery and to refine what sort of surgery you might actually do. What about imaging? Well, x-rays need to be taken standing or weight bearing. Um, ideally a single stance here is if that's possible, but if not, certainly normally weight bearing uh, because clearly the deformity here will change whether the foot is loaded or not loaded. Uh, and at the end of the day, we're interested in the mechanics of the loaded foot, a foot that you can't walk on isn't of great use. So are there any particular angles that you can measure? Well, the answer is yes. Classically, the ones that can be measured, and I think you need to know about this for the test, certainly are the intermetatarsal angle. So the angle between drawn between the shafts of the first and second metatarsals, which should be less than nine degrees. However, 
this needs to be seen in context. If you have a whole forefoot adductus such that the lesser rays are also adducted, you may have a significant deformity, but a relatively normal intermetatarsal angle because it's not just the first ray that's the problem. And these are feet where correction is more challenging more difficult and it's thought potentially a higher recurrence rate after surgery so beware the adductus forefoot as as a whole what about the hallux valgus angle again this is something you'll find um, in, in the books and may come up in the test and that's straightforward it's the angle between the first metatarsal shaft um, and the proximal phalanx and normal should be less than 15 degrees there is one other angle that I think you need to be thinking about, and that is potentially the DMAA, the distal metatarsal articular angle. Um, so that is essentially the angle between the um, articular surface or of the metatar of the first um, MTP joint on the metatarsal head, and or rather it's perpendicular and the shaft of the metatarsal, and it, it should be six to eighteen degrees. Now. The importance of this angle is for determining whether you have a congruent or an incongruent hallux valgus. So again, the angle measurement itself doesn't matter so much as whether it's normal or abnormal because that will change your, your surgery if indeed you are looking at a surgical solution. Um, these angles are often quoted in algorithms determining how one should manage hallux valgus surgically. I, I would suggest a word of caution. As with all X-ray measurements, it's difficult to standardize them and they're not particularly reproducible and that's been well studied. So um, I think by all means know about them and measure them, but I wouldn't be too rigid in the um, application of these as a basis for management of patients. What about hallux interphalangeus? Well, this is a deformity where the first MTP joint is pretty much well aligned, but actually the, the deformity occurs at the IP joint. Um, and again, it's not really so important to measure the angle, we need to know if that level of deformity is there, because if there is, it may change how you'll consider surgery to correct the deformity. Congruence. Now, this is an important concept, and this is really why we have the DMAA measurement. The majority of hallux valgus deformities, particularly those in middle-aged or older women and men, are incongruent. So as we see here, the articular surfaces on the first metatarsal head and the base of the prosmophalanx are mismatched. They are not congruent, they're incongruent. However, in a congruent hallux valgus, well, as seen here, the problem is not just displacement of the first metatarsal off the sesamoids, it's that the metatarsal itself has grown in an abnormal shape such that the articular surface is not sitting perpendicular to the shaft or even close to it. So here, the first MTP joint is actually pointing laterally uh, irrespective of the translation of the metatarsal. And this, hence in this position, the joint surface is congruent. They do actually match, but there's still a deformity. This is commonly seen with younger women, particularly who may present in their teens. There is some evidence it may be less likely to progress, but if you do decide to correct this surgically, it's a bit more complicated than an incongruent one because simply translating the hallux, uh, the first metatarsal laterally will not be sufficient because the big toe will still be pointing off in a valgus direction. You actually have to derotate that articular surface as part of your osteotomy, which does slightly complicate the surgery, although it is still very doable. So some key points just to go over when you're assessing these patients clinically and radiologically. Um, yes, you can measure angles. You can look at the DMAA, you can look at the IMA, the hallux valgus angle, look for an inter interphalangeous deformity, consider whether there is congruency or as here, incongruency of the joints. Is there osteoarthritis on the X-rays? Because that also changes what you might do. And to be honest, uh, this is often underreported, I think, by radiologists, although uh, I think you may be lucky to have a report at all by the time you see an X-ray. Is there an osteophyte on the lateral side of the first metatarsal head? If there is, this may need to be removed during the surgery. And what's the displacement of the metatarsal and sesamoids relative to one another? Also, is there pathology of the lesser rays? Are they deformed? Could this be inflammatory arthropathy? Another point to look for an x-ray. So how is this classified? Well, 
there have been many classifications. The probably most commonly seen one in textbooks was this one, which came from, I think, 2005. Um, where it's mild, moderate, and severe, so good, bad, and ugly in the traditional orthopedic manner. Um, mild, hallux valgus angle of 15 to 30, intermetatarsal of less than 13 degrees, moderate of HVA of 30 to 40, with an IMA of 13 to 18, with a fibula sesamoid um, three quarters or 100% displaced or exposed, and severe, so worse than that, hallux valgus greater than 40 degrees, IMA of greater than 18, and a fibula sesamoid laterally subluxed or exposed. Um, so that's, if you need to have a classification, that's, that's one to look at, although, as I said, the x-ray measurements are not enormously reproducible, and I'd be a little cautious about being too rigorous in, in, in applying this. So when you assess your patients clinically and radiologically, what you need to be thinking about is, is the joint good? Can you offer joint preserving surgery? How technically difficult will the correction be? How much translation do you need? Do you need to derotate as well? What technique will therefore work best? And obviously you have to match your treatment to your patient's expectations. So what about conservative management? Obviously it's an option. I mean, at the end of the day, nobody dies of bunions. So uh, there is no obligation to intervene. Um, it's probably of limited benefit. Um, there was a Cochrane database review quite a long time ago now that found, found no benefit of conservative versus no treatment. Um, I think that's maybe a little harsh. If you have a patient whose main problem is transfer pain or metatarsalgia, then orthotics to offload the lesser metatarsals may actually help them. And of course, even with a wide forefoot, if you get really wide fitting shoes, that too can be of benefit. Similarly, if you're having forefoot overload symptoms, physiotherapy to stretch out the tight gastroc may well be of benefit. And there's always something to be said for reassurance. What about bunion splints? Well, I rather love the idea here that you strap on this device and it corrects your bunion while you sleep, so no effort or inconvenience required at all. And there are, of course, a, a bewildering variety of plastic strap-on devices like this kind of thing here that you can apply to the foot, but the evidence that they correct the deformity is pretty minimal. So what about surgery? Well, the, the aim really is to restore the alignment of the hallux to decrease the intermetatarsal angle. So the sesamoids are reduced as shown here under the first metatarsal head, if necessary to derotate the hallux and correct the DMAA in this one, it, it's not abnormal. And also therefore to reduce the chances of recurrence and refunction or promote function of the first ray. There are a bewildering variety of procedures described, over 100, uh, the dreaded bun bunionectomy. This is a chevron with fixation, a scarf and ache in here, a basal osteotomy, a lapidus with an ache in here, a tightrope between the first and second rays, and here a combination, a triple level correction with a lapidus followed by a chevron followed by a um, akin osteotomy. And of course, there is the new kid on the block. There is the whole question of MIS surgery, um, which normally means a, a minimally invasive chevron or possibly chevron akin osteotomy with percutaneous fixation. So there are a diverse range of techniques applied and many of them can be undertaken in different ways. It is enough to make your poor orthopedic brain ache. However, do not despair because actually you don't need to know most of them. In fact, most hallux valgus surgery can be refined to knowing about a relatively small number of common procedures. So it does of course depend on, your, on the grade of hallux valgus. From mild deformity, I would suggest a chevron, either the classical V or the long L chevron, or a short scarf osteotomy, where the two blur, in, blur into one, one could perhaps debate. For more moderate deformity, probably the scarf osteotomy is the current gold standard. And for a really severe deformity, you need to come more proximally and do either a basal osteotomy, of which there are a variety, um, crescentic, chevron, opening, closing wedge, etc., or a lapidus type first TMT joint fusion. So what are the principles of surgery? Well, in essence, you will need to do a lateral soft tissue release to allow the sesamoids and metatarsal to reestablish their relationship. You need to correct the bony deformity to get the metatarsal over the sesamoids and reestablish the soft tissue balance. 
and you may need to tighten up the medial capsule with some reefing uh, and restore the abductor hallucis connection. So how would you do a lateral release? Well, in essence, the idea is that here on the lateral side of the great toe, you will cut the adductor hallucis at ins insertion onto the proximal phalanx, and you will release here the suspensory ligament. The idea is not that you cut the collateral ligament of the first MTP joint. Um, how you approach this can be done in a number of ways. Some people do a separate dorsal incision in the first second interspace. Other people go transarticularly, you know, through, through the joint. I personally go through a medial approach and go over the top and release it from uh, a dorsal approach, but not a separate incision. It doesn't really matter. There are different ways of, of doing that. Um, either way, the co concept is that you have released the suspensory ligament here so that the metatarsals can move and the um, when you cut your scarf osteotomy, you can displace the metatarsal head back onto the sesamoids. So what about the chevron osteotomy? It's been a, a good old workhorse for many years, it's fair to say. Um, originally, the classical chevron is a V-type osteotomy uh, like this, um, which was then translated and usually left unfixed. Some people would use a K-wire. Um, it has its advantages. It's a small incision. You, you can use it for congruent joints and you usually do a lateral release with it. However, there are some issues with it, specifically because the plantar limb of the osteotomy here uh, comes out on the undersurface of the metatarsal, roughly where the nutrient artery enters. AVN can be a problem with this osteotomy. And if it's unfixed, displacement or malunion can also occur. In recent times, people have tended to modify this and cut the dorsal limb more vertically and the plantar limb more horizontally, so it runs out proximally, avoiding the nutrient artery, so it's more of an L osteotomy rather than uh, a true chevron, and that's how it's usually done in the minimally invasive techniques here, and then fixed either with screws or, as shown here, with a couple of K wires. What about the scarf osteotomy? Well, this is a very powerful tool. It is like much of orthopedics based on carpentry. After all, what is orthopedics if not glorified carpentry? Um, and here is a, a classical star scarf cut in, in woodwork. It allows multi-axial displacement of the two fragments, usually combined with a lateral release. So it's a, it's a Z step cut osteotomy as shown here on the saw bones which then allows translation, extension, rotation, and redisplacement of the um, first metatarsal to its original position. Its advantage is that it's very stable. There's a long contact area and it's fixed normally with two small screws. Because you have such good cancellous bone contact, there is a very low risk of non-union with it. And it's a powerful tool where you can translate and derotate uh, to a fairly great extent. It's a popular choice and it's probably the gold standard for most foot and ankle surgeons for moderate type deformities at the moment. Um, certainly it, it's my workhorse for the majority of bunions um, because it's very versatile. So when you cut it, you can lengthen the first metatarsal a little bit. You can shorten it, although probably you wouldn't want to very often other than very specific circumstances. You can rotate it so you can do a derotation to correct um, an aberrant DMAA for a congruent hallux valgus. You can elevate it, although again, mostly one would seek not to do that, but perhaps most usefully you can use it to depress the first metatarsal. So here when you're making the main um, transverse cut, if you lift your hand and make it downhill, when you translate the osteotomy, you will depress the first metatarsal head. So you bring it back in contact with the sesamoids and the floor and you re-function the first ray. And that for me is one of the great uses of this osteotomy. What if that's not enough? What if a scarf isn't good enough? You need to do something more proximal. The principle is that the more proximal you come, the more powerful a correction you can obtain. Well, there are various options here. You can do a lapidus type first um, TMT fusion as shown here. You can do proximal osteotomies. And as I've said, there are a variety of those described. The advantage is it's a very powerful correction and it allows you to stabilize a hypermobile first ray if you think that's a problem in that particular patient. 
It's not, however, without its problems. Um, Non-union, if you're particularly if you're doing um, a fusion, in most cases like this, you'll tend to immobilize the patient in plaster. So it's a little bit more of a recovery for them. Although I think we're moving a, a bit away from that now, more towards a use of boots. It's technically more challenging than doing a distal or um, <clears throat> metaphyseal osteotomy. And inevitably you can, in doing something this powerful, change the mechanics of the foot. What about the Aiken osteotomy? Well, this again is a commonly used tool and it's a little closing wedge osteotomy of the proximal phalanx as shown here, which allows you to correct the hallux valgus interphalangeus and also potentially pronation of the great toe. Although um, in that case, you um, would have to actually complete the osteotomy, whereas classically the Aiken is described leaving the lateral cortex intact. Um, it therefore corrects the alignment and pull of the FHL and the HL tendons. You can fix it either with a single screw here if you cut it obliquely or a staple um, is also a possibility. Excuse me. <coughs> That'll be my COVID. So um, what about the outcomes? How, how does all of this work? Well, it's quite difficult to evaluate. There are a huge variety of deformities. There are huge varieties of techniques and good studies comparing them accurately and in a reproducible <coughs> way are few and far between. There are a number of studies that show significant improvement in mean deformity and pain scores with the scarf technique, with the chevron techniques and so forth. And there is some evidence uh, that the MIS techniques may be as good. This is one study from Peter Lamb's unit in Australia. However, what about recurrence? There appears to be a huge variation in the literature some papers like Charlie Saltzman's um, meta-analysis showed 5% recurrence at four years. Others such as this paper from Hendrix uh, and Al actually showed 75% at 15 years, but it was a much smaller study. They only had about 60 feet included. So outcomes are difficult to measure and we don't really have great data there. So just to go over what I've said so far, aims of surgery, restore alignment of the hallux, realign the deforming forces, reduce the sesamoids and first metatarsal head relative to one another. The chevron works well for mild deformities, but be careful to preserve the plant of blood supply. For larger deformities, you need a scarf or more proximal um, uh, osteotomy or fusion. <clears throat> so what's the post-operative management? Well, obviously it depends on the procedure. Um, many people will immobilize a patient for six weeks in a heel wedge Darko type shoe, as shown here. Um, quite often I'd use a flat shoe, actually I think it works as well. You'll do a wound check at two weeks. You're gonna to need to take some x-rays either in, intraoperatively or at two weeks or perhaps six weeks postoperatively uh, and maybe for union at three months. Some surgeons use a various toe alignment splint. Um, I personally uh, don't. Driving, again, depending on your technique, for something like a scarf, uh, some people would say six to eight weeks. I actually let my patients drive at four and so far no one's crashed the car as far as I know. So to summarize, hallux valgus, um, it's a complex deformity and it has many manifestations. It's really important to establish the patient's problem, what's actually going on in their foot and their expectations, thus allowing you to select the appropriate procedure for them, if indeed you're gonna operate at all, restore the anatomy and balance the forces. And really, I think for me, when I'm approaching these, these patients and thinking about surgery, what goes through my head is, you know, where do I need to put the first metatarsal and what do I need to do to get it there and keep it there? So thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, and I'm happy to take questions uh, if uh, there are any. Well, thank you, James. Very good talk, as expected, and um, most entertaining and um, full of knowledge. Thank you. Um, please, to everyone attending, do submit your questions through the q and um, Very happy to take all questions that anyone wants to ask. Um, and we'll field as many of them as we can. Um, James, what do you do for your patients post-surgery? Uh, depends what they've had, but given that most will have a scarf, either long, short, or some variation on that particular theme, 
Uh, normally I bandage them up for two weeks um, and I give them a shoe which is either a heel wedge or just a flat or the dreaded blue cozy shoe um, and, and let them flat foot weight bear at that stage with the strict instruction to put their foot up for two weeks. Um, so that, that's what I do. Um, the only ones I ever plaster if I'm doing a lapidus with multiple reconstruction below it, uh, in which case they probably get two weeks in a cast just to keep them anchored in one place and then move into a boot after that and start heel weight bearing them. And um, what are your feelings about hallux valgus before skeletal maturity? What do you do if you see them coming to you with very advanced hallux valgus and a lot of pain? with an open physis? Um, uh, masterly inactivity is what I do. Try and keep them entertained. My, my experience is that trying to do soft tissue correction alone is an unrewarding experience for both surgeon and patient. So if I have somebody prior to skeletal maturity, I will basically try and wait it out. And then once the physis is closed, correct it properly from there. At the end of the day, it's a bony deformity. And in what other branch of orthopedic surgery do you try and correct bony deformities by reefing soft tissues and, uh, and so forth? You, you, you just don't. Um, so no, I, I would try and avoid operating on the skeletally immature because I don't think it works very well. And at the end of the day, when you see you know, these girls, they're, they, 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 they're probably 12 or 13 with a physis is gonna close at 14 anyway. So it's not, it's not usually so difficult to persuade them or their parents at least to hang on for a bit. Are you happy routinely to offer bilateral surgery? Well, it, it depends. If you've got a very motivated patient, uh, I think that's fine. Um, I, I prefer to do them unilaterally or staggered by two weeks, which actually works quite well in terms of the recovery phase. Um, I do sometimes do bilaterals. The only difficulty there is that telling a patient to sit with one foot up is relatively easy, but recovering when you have quite literally no good leg on which to stand is a bit more challenging and quite often they don't look after it very well. So if someone's really motivated, then yes, uh, I will, particularly if it's something like a scarf where you're weight bearing, you know, from the beginning, um, I wouldn't offer bilateral midfoot fusions simultaneously. That would require a really motivated patient. Um, but I mean, the other danger, of course, with doing it bilaterally is that by the time I get to the second side, I might have got a bit bored and be thinking about something else. And, you know, no, not really. Um, but uh, yeah, so the answer is yes, with a, but I have to be slightly persuaded. What's your policy for DVT prophylaxis? <laughs> <laughs> for which, as you and I both know, there isn't a shred of serious evidence one way or the other. Um, the um, assume, Assuming that there is no great history or obvious risk factors, um, then normally, um, partly from a defensive purpose, uh, I actually give people two shots uh, of fragment because they're not going anywhere in the first 40 hours and then don't do anything further beyond that. Again, for if we're talking about a scarf or a, a distal type osteotomy, if someone's immobile in a cast of lapidus, that's a bit different. Um, the only other factor I think that comes in there is if you are doing a gastrocnemius slide with it as well, I'd then be a bit more worried about a DVT, in which case I might then give two weeks of fragment or something. But I freely admit that that is me trying to find a common sense way through what is a, a, a minefield really. And I can give you no science to support that that is what one should do. That's just what I do. Do you ever do multi-level osteotomies, proximal and distal? I don't just mean it's different bones like the scarf aching combination. Yes, um, what, I, what I think works really well, if you have a severe, a really, really severe deformity, so your, your tip of your great toe is somewhere near your fifth toe, then um, actually I would do a lapidus and then below that cut a short scarf, which allows derotation if it's a congruent deformity and then if necessary, an akin below that. So that's my personal preference because in my hands, a, a lapidus works better than a basal osteotomy. I know other people would do basals and I think Callum Clark certainly does multiple levels with a basal osteotomy. Um, the other advantage of doing a lapidus is you're that bit more proximal. So you've got a little bit more room for your distal metatarsal osteotomy. Um, so you can get your two screws in. A question about a scenario I see quite commonly. Um, 
you've got a hallux valgus, but you've also got some degenerative change in the first MTP joint. Um, how do you manage that? Talk to the patient. Um, I think you put your cards on the table and say, okay, well, obviously you examine them. And if, if, if there is mid-arc pain on motion when you've corrected it, or the grind test is strongly positive, then one would try and argue towards this is really hallux rigidus and maybe we should do an MTP fusion or, or something like that. Otherwise, I think you just put your cards on the table and say, well, okay, um, we can do a joint preserving correction. You'll keep some movement. The downside is that, well, it could get worse in the future and you might need another operation to fuse your joint uh, or, or something of that sort. Um, and some patients will say, well, you know, stop, messing around i just want one operation so why don't you just correct it and fuse it now and others will say well i really want to keep movement and let's do a let's do a joint preserving correction and i accept that if it all goes pear-shaped in a few years time that i end up having it fused at that stage i had exactly that discussion with someone this morning um here's another question what's your view about removal of implants do you routinely remove the implants after surgery no not not routinely um, you know, they're, they're, they're usually well buried and they're not causing a problem. So I don't, I certainly don't routinely for, for bunion surgery. Um, the, the only time I would, and sometimes it does happen that after a couple of years, uh, whether it's remodeling issue in the bone, I don't know. You sometimes see Omnitech screws coming back at, you know, 18 months or two years that were fine and then are, are starting to work loose and are irritating on the dorsum of the first metatarsal, in which case I'll take them out if they're symptomatic. But no, I do not routinely uh, advocate removal of metalwork. And here's a question about what is often quite a difficult scenario where you've got marked metatarsus adductus, particularly if the central metatarsals as well as the first ray are in significant adduction. What's, what's your strategy there? That's the difficult one. I think the, fir the first thing I would do there actually is get a standing CT of it. Because when, when you're looking at that deformity, which is very much a triplanar deformity on a plain X-ray, it's, it's difficult to know how much of that is true adduction and how much of it is dorsal or plantar flexion, which is being projected on a, on a plain film to look adducted. So actually I get a, a weight bearing CT first. So assuming that, that, is, that, that it is adduction um, rather than plantar flexion that is the, the, the problem, then I would actually consider doing multiple osteotomies. So you, you, you correct your hallux valgus with your, your first metatarsal osteotomy, and then you can go across to the central rays. And what you can do is like a BRT type basal osteotomy, and you can rotate that and fix that. Um, it's, it's, it's a challenge, it's a difficult one, and it's certainly not what you wanna see first thing on a Monday morning in clinic. Another question here, do you, when you're doing a scarf osteotomy, do you always add an Aiken osteotomy or do you only do that if there's a hallux valgus interval and GS deformity as well? And do you modify your technique in that situation? Um, the, the short answer is I don't always, but in, in practice, the vast majority of the time, there is some level of interphalangeous deformity. So um, in essence, I, I suppose the way I would put it is that with this kind of surgery, it, it is a la carte, it's not set menu. So what you're going to do is you cut the scar first, in most cases, get the metatarsal head reduced over the sesamoids, fix it, and then step back and have a look at what the toe is doing. And if you've got a nicely reduced, reduced first MTP joint, but there is deformity distal to that, then I will do an Aiken, um, which I normally leave the lateral cortex intact for. So it's a closing wedge. And then I actually use a little blade plate staple to fix it rather than the oblique screw, but you know, you can do it different ways. In the situation of someone with hallux valgus with a, a very marked planar valgus foot, but with no flat foot pain, so no hind foot symptoms, just a symptomatic hallux valgus, what do you do in that situation? Do you just treat the hallux valgus or do you do anything more? Again, I think you have a rather in-depth discussion with the patient. Um, most of the time, um, assuming that we're not, we're not looking at 
at you know, serious tibialis posterior dysfunction or something like that. If we assume it's a physiological pes planus with a hallux valgus, uh, most of the time I will en end up just correcting the hallux valgus actually. Um, I think it's quite a big ask to say to a patient, well, actually, you know, I want to correct your whole pes planus and so forth as well when you've got no symptoms from it. And you're making your surgery rather more complicated than I think asking for trouble potentially going that way. So it, assuming that the pes planus is not pathology, but just that patient's foot, then I would just correct the hallux valgus, to be honest. Another question about the lapidus procedure. Um, what do you think is the risk of non-union and um, how do you rate the outcomes? Um, we have to, as a technical point, we're talking about a modified lapidus because Paul Lapidus' original description, which was from something like the 1950s, I can't remember exactly, uh, of course, was A, without fixation, and B, included also fusing the first and second rays together. So most people don't do it that way. You, you're always going to fix it these days. So I think the original non-union rate was huge, something like 30% off the top of my head, although I may have that number wrong. Um, I think actually the non-union rate is low. I think it's actually extremely low. Um, the as in I, I can think of barely any in in the fifteen years I've I've been been, been doing them. Um, obviously, you've got to have decent preparation of of the joint surfaces. You've got to into proper cancellous bone. Um, you obviously need to fix it rigidly. Personally, I actually fix it by passing uh, a four mil cannulated screw first across the joint, um, usually dorsal plantar going proximal to distal to get compression and then put a, a low profile locking plate on the medial side. Um, and that seems to work very well. So I think, I think non-union is actually in that, done like that relatively uncommon. Um, I haven't actually had to revise any for non-union. So it's you know, not really up there as a big thing, although I know it, it is reported in the literature. Having said that, if you said, how many lapiduses do I do? Well, the answer is probably about, you know, one for every nine compared to scarfs. Um, the, um, in terms of the outcomes and mechanics, it, it can be challenging. You've got, you've got to get the positioning of that first ray right, and it's not particularly easy. Um, if you get it right, I think it works very well. Uh, but you, you, there can be issues where you've taken a, a hypermobile foot in someone that's used to being super flexible and you've stabilized it. So in a way you've made it kind of more normal, but not normal for them. So um, yeah, it's, it's not a tool to be played with lightly, but then you're not gonna be going to the midfoot for a, a simple, straightforward common or garden bunion uh, anyway to be honest. Um, I do think actually it's more reproducible than the basal osteotomies, but that, that's a personal viewpoint. And, and I know other people would disagree with that. Does that answer your question vaguely? <laughs> Fine. Very good. Thank you. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, one housekeeping point for everyone. If you open the chat function on the webinar, you'll be able to see the link and the code to get your attendance certificate. So you'll see a, a web link and a, co a code that you need. So do please have a look at that now, because once you sign off, that won't be visible anymore. Um, there's a question here about scarf osteotomies and rotational correction for, of the DMAA. Do you use um, bone wedges or anything else like that to try to augment your correction, or do you just rely on the intrinsic stability of the scarf osteotomy after your rotation? Um, the, there's a couple of things. Um, Firstly, when I'm when I'm making the distal cut, I will actually cut it as a as a wedge, the distal dorsal cut, rather than just a single transverse cut, which one would normally do. So I'll make that and then take a little wedge out to allow for the the back the back rotation um, of the osteotomy. Um, if you're doing that with a full length scarf, well, another little point is that sometimes the proximal um, uh, tip of the plantar fragment can actually start to crash into the second metatarsal and become a problem. So actually, if I'm do doing a derotation, I'll actually take a bone liver and just take off that spike that you see at the base of the first metatarsal, um, just gives you a bit more room to work. That then does also give you a bit of bone graft if you do have a gap that you decide you want to put something into. Um, but, uh, but no, normally I'll cut a wedge distally to give me room to do the derotation and then just fix it with two screws in the, in the normal way.
So we're getting a few um, rather more technical questions here. Um, and so the next one is also quite technical. Um, in particularly in the more osteoporotic patients, in the frailer patients, you often find that there isn't really much, if any, metaphyseal bone. And when you're doing a scarf osteotomy, you can translate it and there's not much buttress of bone. And you get this phenomenon that we call troughing, where one piece of the edge of the cortex dips into the hollow cavity in the center of the metatarsal. It leads to an in inadequate translation and a rotational deformity. Um, is that something you encounter frequently? And if so, what do you do about it to prevent it being a problem? Um, it's something that one does encounter from time to time. I wouldn't say frequently, actually. Um, and certainly I think one of the issues there can be a technical one, which is that if you don't make your transverse cut very cleanly the first time, you're more likely to end up with that kind of problem because you've just you've destroyed bone as, as, as you've gone. Nevertheless, it can happen in, in, you know, with the best will in the world. Um, I think the moral there is if you've got somebody who's known to be very osteoporotic, uh, or is obviously so, you might want to rethink the technique um, and potentially do something like a first MTP fusion um, or potentially even a lapidus, which I think is more secure in that situation. So if you, I think really what I would say is if you're going to look at a scarf, the don't push the envelope of what you can do with a scarf in someone who's very elderly with osteoporotic bone, um, because you, you may be asking too much of that technique. Yeah. Um, question, technical question about the lapidus. Do you advance your compression screw into the, into the middle cuneiform? And if so, does it cause you any problems? Um, no, 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 not, no, not usually is, is, the, is the short answer. Um, the, the compression screw I actually put from the um, dorsum of the medial cuneiform uh, into the base of the uh, first metatarsal to, to pull the lapidus together. I don't normally cross uh, anything into the, um, into the middle cuneiform uh, at all. Um, the other thing I was just thinking about the previous question, actually, we asked about um, troughing, is if it if it does happen, the only other thing you can do is use any bits of bone graft you've got from an akin or from a minimal bunionectomy to to try and plug your gap, as it as it were. But it's it's difficult. Uh, but with the lapidus, no, I don't routinely span into the other cuneiforms, although that is part of lapidus's original technique. Um, now, there's a question here about the, what you do with the second ray, and I know we haven't covered much on the lesser rays because that's a subject of another webinar, um, but clearly the, the two are very much interlinked, as you talked about with your transfer um, phenomenon slides. Would you consider repairing the plantar plate when it comes to addressing the second toe deformity as part of your forefoot reconstruction? Um, yes, I certainly would consider it, uh, and I do do it. Um, so let, let's suppose that you've, you've corrected your first ray, you've got a, a hammer toe, you've got a plantar plate rupture, you've got a subluxed or, or even dislocated second MTP joint, and presumably a hammer toe, then sure, I'll do a PIP fusion. Um, and if the plantar plate is repairable, then yes, I will repair it. There are some, as I'm sure you know, Robert, where you, 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 you open it up and you look at it and there's just absolutely nothing there. Um, but if it is repairable, then yes, I'll do that. And there are, you know, use a scorpion or a viper to do that. There are a number of uh, instruments available, but yes, uh, I do. Fantastic. Well, that's bringing us up towards the hour mark. Um, I think it's time to wrap things up. And once again, I must say, James, thank you very much for an excellent talk. Thank you for everyone who submitted questions and allowed us to have a bit of discussion about some of the intricacies of this. I do hope this has been useful to everyone. Um, final question, which I think we have got time for. How often do you see avascular necrosis after a chevron osteotomy? And if you do see it, what, what do you do about it? Um, I don't see it because I don't do a Chevron osteotomy ever, um, <laughs> which I know is avoiding the question, but it happens to be the truth. Um, in my practice, if I wanted to do only a short distal osteotomy, I would cut a short scarf uh, is the short answer uh, and fix it. So I, I'm afraid I simply don't do the Chevron. I've talked about it today because it's an established technique and it's part of the BOFAS principles course that we cover it. Uh, but the short answer is in, in, in person, I don't see it because I don't do that operation. 
um, I, how, if you, how often have I seen it after a short scarf? I haven't, uh, basically. Um, but the 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 incidence quoted with with a chevron is, is you know between five and twenty percent depending on which paper you want to read. But bear in mind some of these are very old papers, so um, I think it's probably a relatively low incidence. But it's certainly a reason why many people now will do a, a an elongated plantar limb on the chevron. So they're doing more of an L osteotomy really rather than a chevron, a true chevron. At which point, of course, you beg, beg that begs the question: Where does a elongated plantar limb of a chevron blur into a short scarf um, and the answer is I suppose when you formalize that third cut but you know the difference between them is 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 probably really splitting hairs to be honest well again thank you very much everyone for attending thank you James for putting all the work into the slides and the presentation and I'll just say to everyone, please do complete your feedback so you get the feedback forms and please do keep joining us, join us again, and all these will be posted as usual on the website for later access at leisure. Thank you everyone and good night. <laughs>